Well, hello everyone, happy Monday, and welcome to another episode of You've Got the Power. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Deitch, and of course we are here with the Chief Medical Officer of the Centeno Schultz Clinic in Bloomfield, Colorado, Dr. Chris Centeno. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Jason. We have a great topic here today. As you know, on Mondays we do what I what we can to really focus on the many of you that uh, talk about, think about, discuss, and in some cases, unfortunately, suffer from CCI, cranial cervical instability. Our question and topic for today is, is there a single test to determine if your symptoms are caused by CCI? That's the question. I know when it comes to uh, healthcare, we're all looking for sort of the answer, the definitive answer. Doc, what do we need to know about uh, healthcare, biology, and certainty? Yeah, I think it's important to realize uh, that, you know, patients all want 100% certainty. And I, I get that, and, and that makes total sense. Uh, having said that, uh, in medicine, that's rarely possible. Um, and in CCI, it's even less possible. So it's important to understand that there's a way that we get to a diagnosis of CCI and uh, that there are certain components along the way that we look at in order to try to uh, get to the highest likelihood that we have the correct diagnosis for that patient. But regrettably, you know, at, at this point, there's no blood test I can give you um, or a magic image I can take that says this person definitely has symptomatic cranial cervical instability and this person doesn't. Now, there are times when things are really messed up and someone needs emergent neurosurgery where that becomes a, a much clearer thing, meaning obviously you can take an x-ray showing that someone's got a hangman's fracture and say that person definitely needs surgery. But we're talking about patients who have a collection of symptoms who may or may not have been exposed to trauma or have EDS and how do we link those symptoms to what's going on in the upper cervical spine with instability? And that's where we're really into that art of medicine combined with some science, combined with some imaging, combined with some common sense to try to get to that diagnosis. Let's break it down in some detail. If you're watching, if you've got questions, now's the great time to ask. You're on with Dr. Chris Centeno. Dr. Centeno, in fact, invented the procedure, the PICL procedure that has helped many, many people suffering from CCI. So now's your time to really ask your questions from, uh, I think it's very safe to say, the world's foremost expert on the topic. Uh, Doc, let me, let me, I guess, break down a few things. One, there may be some people that don't know what the symptoms of CCI are, so that may be one thing to maybe bring up. But the second thing I want to make sure people understand, as you sort of went into and today's topic is about tests, let's list out what are the different specific things that you're looking for, that you're testing, that sort of put together the collection of data you're looking at in order to determine you know, whether, yes, positively they do have this condition or they don't. What are they suffering from and how do you, what are the different things you look at in order to determine a definitive CCI diagnosis? Yeah, so let's start with symptoms. We actually uh, did a survey of our, about 100 of our patients who we had confirmed were highly likely to have CCI and asked them about their symptoms. Uh, so the most frequent symptoms out there that we collected for CCI patients were headache, dizziness, lightheadedness, um, numbness, tingling, neck pain, brain fog, fatigue, uh, and then they kind of go down from there. TMJ, facial issues, tinnitus, visual disturbances, etc. So a big collection of symptoms. Now the problem is that those symptoms are shared, obviously, with other conditions. So you have to figure out a way to make sure those are not coming from these conditions so that we know they're covered, they're, they're coming from CCI. And there is a methodology we use to do that. So we look at uh, the results of someone's imaging, uh, their history of how all of this began, and obviously that includes their symptoms, and then the response to treatment uh, as well. How are they responding to various treatments? And 
all of that is put together to try to increase the likelihood that they have CCI. So for example, for imaging, uh, we tend to like digital motion x-ray. There are others that like static images like cervical MRI. But uh, for instance, that might be a C1, C2 overhang on DMX. Uh, if we get to history, that would be, is there something out there that we know uh, can cause this? So that means either some sort of trauma or the person has some sort of congenital abnormality like EDS. In that same vein of history, do the symptoms make sense? So they have some of these symptoms that we're talking about. And then finally, response to treatment. Uh, that might be, for instance, one of the things we know CCI patients really kind of crash and burn with is active physical therapy. And many of them can do pretty well with upper cervical chiropractic. So those are response to treatment things that we're looking at. Or let's say that they've had an injection in the upper cervical facet joints that has helped bring down their pain temporarily. So those are all the things we look at in order to get to that CCI diagnosis. And you gotta realize that just one of those by itself in isolation doesn't mean a lot. We've gotta have all of them kind of pointing the same direction uh, to be highly likely CCI. And it's certainly possible that in some patients, maybe they all don't point that direction, but most of them do. But that's how we get to that diagnosis. Uh, this feels a little bit uh, more like it's a Sherlock Holmes episode more than it is an algorithm. Um, and that you've got to look for the clues and you've got to put things together and you actually have to have some uh, skill uh, to understand what the clues mean and where they come from and some experience with all of that. Uh, as much as we all wish that medicine was an algorithm, you know, this plus this equals that every time, all the time. Um, let me ask you this question from, a, I'll, I'll say, a higher level. Uh, that's what you look at as the doctor. If someone is suffering with these conditions, they suspect it's CCI, and they start going to other types of doctors, what type of experience would they expect, and what's the danger in going to those other types of professionals for a condition as specific as this? Well, I think the big issue there is just frustration. So a lot of CCI patients end up going to a lot of uh, medical and surgical specialists, uh, and they get kind of pushed around in the pinball machine uh, of specialists, you know, like a pinball going from specialist to specialist to specialist, uh, and not getting a lot of answers. So there's a certain degree of frustration that many of them share because they've spent a lot of money trying to work all of this up. They've had several million dollar workups done. Uh, that's, you know, may not cost a million dollars, but that's that's kind of what we call it uh, in the medical field where someone just gets test after test after test and nothing's really coming back to give them much traction. So I think there's a lot of frustration there. And one of the things we commonly see is that rather than, get, than this getting identified in the first couple of months, uh, which would be appropriate, it's not getting identified sometimes until the first couple of years or even longer. And that's a concern because the longer this goes without a concrete diagnosis and some specific treatment focused at it, the more likely uh, we are to see situations where someone gets harder and harder to help uh, if they go 20 years without identifying that this is their problem. We will get to all of your questions in one moment. I want to ask you one more question before we do, Doc. Uh, what many people may not know is that you train hundreds and you have trained thousands of doctors over the years, medical doctors who uh, are, in many cases, orthopedic specialists. My question for you is, what can you share with us about those doctors that don't necessarily gravitate to the Regenix approach towards your approach? but tend to be, I'll say, most of the practicing medical doctors out there. What can you share with us about the difference in their thinking versus the difference in your thinking? I'm specifically sort of getting to, you know, in, in, in all types of healthcare, you tend to find and diagnose the problem that you have a solution for. Um, how does that fit into this conversation when traditional orthopedists, traditional doctors, general physicians, and so on, don't really have solutions for these things what have you what what can you share with us about your experience doctor to doctor 
with either their affinity for going and learning about these things or their resistance in doing so? Yeah, I think we tend to see, uh, again, uh, a problem here sometimes on the surgical side and sometimes on the alternative medicine side. So on the surgical side, we tend to see uh, patients getting very, very aggressive uh, treatments like fusion. Uh, and those are one-way street treatments. There's no going back once you go down that, that road. Um, and then having lots of complications and still having all the same issues or certain issues got better and new ones appeared. Um, or uh, we tend to see CCI patients going and getting, for instance, simple posterior prolotherapy, believing that it's going to cure their problem, but it, it's really not. Those the, the ligaments that need to be injected that hold the head on are not being injected, or at least most of them are not. So those are the two sort of traps we see. Uh, not saying that both of those things might not be appropriate in the right patient, uh, but for generally these patients, uh, if it's a surgical fusion, you're skipping a big step there. And after that, and if it's simple prolotherapy, uh, while that helps every once in a while in this patient population, it's not common that that helps. And so in both instances, people are either burning bridges or not burning bridges, but spending an immense amount of money, time, energy, effort, and resources on things that are probably not going to assist them. Thank you very much. And uh, our message to you as uh, you've got the power is to understand Many questions we receive are based on the treatment. You know, will this treatment help this symptom or this condition? And what, one of the things we want to make sure that you're aware of is that if you don't get the right diagnosis from the get-go, uh, then those treatments for those symptoms uh, likely are not going to work if they do their sort of random happenstance or good fortune. But the science of medicine uh, really is about the doctoring of having the right expert be able to do the right analysis to determine exactly what condition you're in and then what the right type of procedure is for your specific unique condition. Not all CCI conditions are the same. Not all people are the same. Everyone has a uniqueness and your power is best gained when you realize your uniqueness and you know how to find the experts who understand how to diagnose these conditions better than anyone. And in my opinion, there is no one better than Dr. Centeno and Schultz, again, where they invented these procedures and continue to invest, I believe, millions of dollars in the research that it takes to keep on searching for how do you get better results with less, inv less invasiveness, faster, easier, and make sure you've got the most accurate diagnosis possible to help the most amount of people possible. With all of that, let's go to questions. Here we go. This one was submitted in advance by Louis, Luis Michel, Mitchell. Excuse me. The question is, I had a DMX three years ago, but never pursued treatment because I didn't want surgery. Would that one still be usable? You know, I think it's certainly better than no DMX, that's for sure. But uh, in general, I would say we'd want something uh, within the last year or so. But listen, better than no DMX, uh, so it's a great starting point to try to, to see what's going on. It's unlikely that the DMX got much better through the years, uh, more likely that it may have worsened a little bit or stayed the same. So certainly better than no DMX, and it's a good starting point. Uh, and would the recommendation be to schedule an appointment with you or Dr. Schultz and show you that DMX so that you can sort of say, hey, you know what, this tells us a lot, or maybe it's better to get, you know, a more updated one. And the comparison sometimes shows the progression of what was three years ago and what is now. But uh, the answer to me is uh, get on your appointment book and let's find out specifically uh, what, what condition they're in and how usable that would be. Does that sound right? Yeah, I, I think that sounds right. Uh, yes. All right. Uh, Emily Balfour is asking the question, will this be saved? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, this video will stay here on Facebook. Uh, you can invite others to watch it. You can, in fact, click the share button uh, and share it with others, or you can just uh, send it to yourself and watch it another time. Uh, but all of our videos are shared. In fact, if you scroll up that newsfeed, 
You can watch the last year of our programs together. Thank you for asking. All right, uh, Livia asks the question, I would like to know if it's okay to do the PICL with an active chronic EBV. Given that the EBV may be active due to the body not functioning properly due to CCI, it can be a problem to make it dormant. It's a connected circle. I have a travel to Broomfield soon, and I'm unsure what to do in this case. Would low levels of EBV be okay to do a PICL? Can't the EBV destroy the healing PICL process? Thank you. Yeah, I don't think we have any data at this point on EBV and this type of stem cell mediated ligament healing. Uh, I would say just looking at everything we know that uh, shouldn't be a problem or an issue. And as you bring up, it's a circle. So you got to break the circle somehow, meaning that if it's the CCI leading to uh, exhaustion, which leads to the susceptibility for EBV, um, then, you know, something's got to break that circle, right? Uh, so I, I would suggest this is a good first step. Um, but we don't have much data on what happens with EBV and mesenchymal stem cell mediated ligament healing at this point. All this stuff is just too new for that kind of information to be out there. All righty. Uh, and EBV is, uh, you want to clarify for everybody that? Yeah, Epstein-Barr virus, so sort of a chronic infection. Uh, that may lead to lots of different types of symptoms, usually caused by someone being uh, exhausted, if you will, probably, uh, you know, more scientific terms than that. Uh, but that's the general idea, and that they get a chronic infection, uh, a chronic viral infection, uh, chronic fatigue, all those, uh, all of those things. But, you know, many times that's a circle. Something is setting that off. Something is not allowing the person to recover. And in this case, you know, thought is that that could be CCI, which is going to cause fatigue, uh, brain fog, and all the other stuff, including lack of exercise, which is going to further then make the person more susceptible to these types of problems, including other things, uh, weight gain, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, uh, high blood sugars, all of those go hand in hand. So at some point, something's got to break that circle. Yeah, uh, and I've, uh, I've also heard the circle uh, be known as a spiral because uh, you don't stay in the same place. You're sort of either getting worse or getting better uh, over time. It is all connected. Uh, the key, of course, being how do you maintain as much energy for healing uh, as you possibly can as opposed to keep letting these things steal your energy, not sleeping, gaining weight, not exercising. All of those things steal your energy and thus the circle goes downward spiral. Um, Damien, uh, thank you for your help. Damien said, yes, the lives are always saved. Thank you, Damien. We hope you enjoyed our Friday show, and thanks for being a regular viewer. Emily says, uh, Livia Benkova would love to know if you get an answer to this, and uh, of course now you hopefully know that answer as well. Livia follows up, so couldn't Prolo help even with mild cases of CCI where a person is still functional? Um, yeah, so, so again, as I was saying before, the problem with uh, traditional prolotherapy, and, and we've got two different issues there, or two different levels. The, the first level would be just traditional prolotherapy, which is mostly blind injection uh, into the ligaments of the spine. Uh, the problem is that it's very hard to inject these deep ligaments in the upper neck without guidance. And then if you add guidance to that, you then are in a situation where you're injecting, let's say, two of the eight ligaments that might lead to someone's CCI. So you got a two out of 10 chance or so that you're going to address it, uh, but an eight out of 10 chance that you're never going to be able to get close to the ligaments that are causing the problem, which are internal and deeper than you can reach with traditional posterior prolotherapy. So that's the problem I was bringing up in that we've seen a lot of people, um, and I'm talking not, not one, not 10, but dozens of people, if not more, that have blown through five, 10, $20,000 doing posterior prolotherapy injections, PRP injections, bone marrow injections. Um, and, and the doctors that are doing this are nowhere near the ligaments that are actually holding the head on. Um, 
And so the patient is getting little tiny bits of improvement, but not a lot because those ligaments aren't being accessed. So it's one of the bigger problems we see where someone's blown through $20,000, they come to us and they say, I have no more money left. I can't do anything. And you're like, well, you know, this is kind of awful because you spent a lot of money on something that really had very little chance of, of helping you, but they, they don't know. And the doctors really aren't telling them that. The doctors are trying to convince them that they can fix their craniocervical instability by doing these posterior injections. And, and it's possible, it's just not likely. I'm gonna see if I can break this down and uh, forgive the pun, dissect this a little bit more in detail because I think this is where a lot of people get sort of mixed up. And, and let me just think out loud with you and see if this makes some sense. There is a difference in these questions. When people ask questions, do you think it can help? That could be interpreted as, can it help my headache? And it also can be interpreted as, can it help stabilize my instability? And I think oftentimes people, you know, don't get specific enough. So they think, okay, well, if I inject Prolo or something else, maybe it can help my symptoms and therefore get some sort of temporary relief. But what it's not doing is what exactly you're suggesting, which is only through the image guidance, only through understanding the ligament laxity and the concept of cervical, cranial cervical instability, which many doctors do not understand. That's where the sort of language gets confusing and people are like, yes, it can help. But helping symptoms is a very different objective than helping correct the cause of the problem. Do you want to go into some detail about those two things? I think most people's confusion comes from sort of that misunderstanding of helping what? Uh, and most people's goal tends to be, I just want to feel better uh, at whatever cost. If the drugs worked, I'd take those too, because they're not thinking of the downward long-term consequences of correcting the cause as opposed to just eliminating symptoms at all costs. Your thoughts on that, Doc? Yeah, listen, I, I think when it comes to instability, you have to realize that the, the symptoms are generated by things getting beat up by the instability. So uh, we can treat those things that are getting beat up, and sometimes we can get some nice relief. The problem is that relief doesn't last for the long term. Um, and so you've then got to go and fix the problem that's causing these symptoms, which is, again, fixing that, that instability. Um, so th that's really what you're discussing there, is that there's, there's another level to understanding here where we need to try to fix what's causing the problems. But we can get some really nice relief in some patients by just injecting the right structures that are causing pain. The problem is that relief doesn't last so long. Um, that, and that brings up something, Jason, I just wanna mention for all uh, viewers today, is that we have a patient who I saw last week who is just doing fantastic. She was one of the first PICL patients we ever did. Uh, I think we've done her four times she has really learned a lot in this journey. She uh, was using a gyro stem to try to help um, get stronger. And uh, she has agreed at some point to come on the show and be interviewed as someone who has gone through the whole gauntlet. I mean, she had CCI related to a car crash for many years. You know, no one knew what that was. Even when we started treating her, we didn't know that she had CCI. Eventually we headed that direction. That happened to coincide when we started the PICL procedure. And uh, she's doing great. In fact, she's doing so well that she, you know, she reports 90% improvement. In fact, the last visit we had wasn't even about her CCI. It was about some stuff going on in her low back and down her leg. Um, and the funniest thing about that appointment was I never mentioned her CCI during the entire appointment. And Shelly brought it up to me later. Hey, just want to let you know, here's how this is doing. And I asked her if she'd come on the show and she has agreed to come on the show at some point. So she can be interviewed by both of us. And just to, to get a sense of, here's someone who's been through the whole process. Here's what she's learned and to give everyone an opportunity to ask her questions. That's outstanding. We look forward to that. Uh, and hopefully all of you as viewers are, are, are learning how to think like doctors think. Uh, and there is a difference between treating symptoms and correcting causes. And if you'll remember that distinction, you will make, I think, a lot more better decisions in the future 
uh, because most people in America have learned to basically just simply focus on uh, temporarily treating symptoms. That's what every drug commercial teaches you to do. Uh, and it seems like, you know, if I can just take it and in 15 seconds my headache is gone, I can go back to the beautiful life I see in the commercial. We've sort of been conditioned that that's a good thing. Uh, and the only good thing that's for is pretty much the pharmaceutical industry or the drug industry that's selling you that drug. Because there's no doctor in their right mind that would tell you that your headache is fixed or cured or what's causing your headache is a you know, lack of medication in your system. That's not why you have the headache. So understanding those nuances between treating effects and correcting causes might be one of the most valuable things you at home can learn about your health and healthcare decisions. All right, we're uh, running up to our half hour. Let's get a bunch of questions in and we will wrap up our show in just a few moments. Sherry Bowley says, my daughter is 12 weeks out from cervical PRP and fighting a viral infection that's making her feel bad. Can she take Advil at this point if she needs it or is it still too soon for NSAIDs? No, she can take Advil at, at this point if she needs it. That's totally fine. Okay. Uh, let's get back. Thank you for your question, Sherry. Tamara Field, a name I recognize. Thanks for being a regular viewer. Hello. Does PRP at CCJ cause inflammation at the brainstem? Thank you. No, it shouldn't cause inflammation at the brainstem, meaning that there are things, realize that you've got um, some structure there, right? You've got uh, the bones uh, that have a hole through them, meaning the neck bones. Uh, that hole is the spinal canal. And then ligaments around the spinal canal, and then the dura around that, and then the cerebral spinal fluid around that. And then finally, the spinal cord and the brainstem in the middle. So, uh, so while changes in how things move could cause inflammation, uh, direct effects of what's happening out here is probably not causing inflammation uh, inside of all of that, especially since you've got the cerebral spinal fluid moving up and down const constantly around the brainstem. So no, there, there shouldn't be any impact from one to the other. Thank you for your question, Tamara. Kara Nakispendi, I hope I said that right, uh, asks the question, how do you manage slash evaluate tethered cord? Will you do PICL if there is a possibility of a cult tethered cord? Yeah, we've talked about a, a cult tethered cord many, many times on this program. So there, there's a couple different categories there. You've got, you know, what neurosurgeons would consider tethered cord. Uh, and that's actually, you know, evidence of a, a, a spinal cord that is off by a couple levels, meaning it's way, way too high where it ends. And then you've got this concept of a cult tethered cord, which is extremely controversial in the neurosurgical community. If you were to ask a thousand neurosurgeons, probably one or two would agree that a cult tethered cord is a thing. Um, uh, so, so now we're in that world of trying to figure out what to do with these patients. And uh, uh, in general, if you believe you have adult tethered cord, we're unlikely to move forward with PICL, uh, that's something you need to get uh, handled or dealt with in another way. Uh, generally, that's neurosurgery. The problem with moving forward with that neurosurgery is again, it's a it's a permanent no way back uh, procedure. Meaning, once you snip the bottom of the cord, there are permanent changes in the biomechanics of the spinal cord and the spinal nerves that can never be restored. Um, so, you know, that's a really big decision to make. Um, and we would rather you get that all sorted out before you consider this type of procedure. So in general, if you're still sorting that out, we wouldn't consider you for this procedure at this point. And so the goal would be to uh, find out, you know, the question is, is there if there is a possibility? Um, and so the, the answer is, you know, rule that out first so that there is no possibility is what I'm hearing you say. Or at least that's dealt with, um, because okay. our focus is going to be, how can we get your uh, cervical or cranial cervical instability dealt with and reduced? Um, and if you've got ongoing tethered cord, better to, to get that dealt with. Now, we may disagree completely with that diagnosis as well, 
So we may look at you and say, huh, we don't have enough evidence to get there. You know, again, be very, very careful with what I would call Facebook diagnosis versus actual clinical diagnosis. Um, meaning that, you know, we've seen people who are convinced they have, for instance, Eagle syndrome is a common one, but there's really not a lot of evidence that they've got Eagle syndrome. When you look at all the clinical parts and pieces, that diagnosis was really made on a Facebook discussion group rather than by a qualified physician who is an expert in this area, who is looking at all the parts and pieces and saying, here's the likelihood on this, this diagnos diagnosis meter that you've got you know, if it's over here, you probably have Eagle syndrome. If it's there, uh, maybe. If it's over here, probably not. Um, so just be careful with all of that because it's very easy to get diagnosed via uh, a, uh, a Facebook group. And that's not what you should be doing at this point. You need to get that diagnosis um, and talk to a number of different people about it, not just me or not just Dr. Schultz, uh, but others as well. Uh, who are both advocates for that diagnosis and not, because you, like I said, you could go to a lot of neurosurgeons who would say that doesn't, that's not a thing. Um, I personally believe it's probably a thing um, and it needs to be dealt with in the right patients, but just realize that it's, it's something that's got to be sorted out. They, uh, they can be complicated details sometime. All right, Tamara follows up with, I have reverse curve and herniations C4 to C7. My upper cervical rotates. Uh, can PRP at CO through C7 help stabilize my neck? Thank you. Um, I mean, we would certainly do the uh, supraspinous interspinous ligaments in the back, which can help to help a little bit with that reverse curve. Uh, if you've got craniocervical instability, then we would need to tighten that down and then get you into a curve restoration program to try to restore that uh, curve. A lot of that also is gonna depend on how much bony changes there's been. So if you've got a lot, if it's been there a long time and you've got you know, bony changes that are facilitating the lack of curve, then that's going to be a lot harder to deal with than if it's only been there a couple months or a year and there's no bony changes yet. Um, so quite a, quite a few different things going on there. One of the reasons why uh, the Centeno Schultz Clinic has the proactive program is the idea that you don't want to wait until it's so bad you can't tolerate it anymore before you decide to take care of your conditions or yourself that these types of spinal conditions, especially all orthopedic conditions, don't go away by themselves. It's why we keep bringing up this point between the problem and the pain. The pain may come and go. Hey, it hurts when I do this, but when I don't, it's better. It doesn't hurt as much, but there is an underlying condition or problem that usually requires some sort of attention. That's what we're talking about. All right, this is our last question for today. Bear with me, it's a doozy. Uh, our regular viewer, Roger Chin, says, with no doctor here willing to diagnose something definitive linking my CCI and injuries to a specific car accident in 2014, the car insurance company here asserted it was due to pre-existing injuries in a 1994 car accident, even though I was able to work for 20 years after that one. I was forced to settle out of court after my PICL number one because I was told a CCI diagnosis would not have made much difference here in British Columbia. How successful have your patients been in getting compensation after you've diagnosed CCI? Or is it just not yet, quote, popular enough to gain credibility? PICL was my only hope to overcome the mediocre insurance settlement. With DMX number two showing improvement, it shows doing PICL was more beneficial than going to court, hoping I'll be able to return to work. Your thoughts, Doc? Yeah, so you have to realize that um, Canada in this regard is a little bit unique, uh, meaning that uh, about 10, 15 years ago, more towards 15, uh, Canada and many of the uh, insurers around British Columbia in particular, ICBC being one of them, um, started an extremely aggressive program to try to convince family doctors in the province that there really was no such thing as a chronic whiplash type injury. 
uh, and that what they needed to be looking for were fractures and herniated discs and things that needed surgery. And if there was something that wasn't obvious on a cervical MRI, it didn't exist. And you know that, that went a long way. I mean, uh, we had countless numbers of GPs that were being educated about that who now, to be, now need to be uneducated about it or de-educated about it. Um, so realize that Canada is pretty unique in that. And that had, in British Columbia, that had a lot to do with ICBC. Um, and regrettably, that's an uphill battle there. Uh, here, it's a little bit easier because we don't have uh, these quasi-private public insurers. We've got lots of different insurance companies. That's not to say it'll be any easier to convince uh, someone that you've got craniocervical instability, uh, but we have a specialist care system that is not socialized. So it's a lot easier to see specialists or find them within the system who can understand what's going on uh, than it is in Canada. So regrettably, that that's a uh, while it, it's a problem that exists in a lot of places, it's particularly bad in Canada. These are some of the really important issues. Roger, you bring it up, and someone tends to bring it up on every show, that there is a big difference between your insurance company's priorities and your priorities. In other words, in many cases, in most cases I might even speculate, that insurance companies don't have your health as their top priority. Governments don't necessarily have your health as their top priority, that there are you know, standard operating procedures, there are, there is institutional momentum, there are influences by other industries that trickle down and create policies that don't always put your health as the number one reason for why they do what they do. And it's one of the reasons why we do oftentimes say you want to find a practice like Centeno Schultz practice that is independent of these large, massive institutional organizations or government organizations that have the freedom and have the independence to in fact be doctors. The art of doctoring, you can ask any doctor, uh, has often been lost because most of these institutions have heavy influences in what you can say, what you can do, what they will cover, what they won't cover. And at the end of the day, it's not always based on the science and it's not always based on what's gonna be in your best interest. Uh, I'll read Roger's comment and then Doc, I'll ask you to wrap it up. Uh, Roger said, I didn't know about that history. That explains my ICBC experience. Thank you again so much for providing an independent solution and truth. Roger, you're welcome. Thanks for being a regular viewer. That's why we ask you to share this program with others. You are getting an inside scoop here from an insider uh, who is really the world's foremost expert. I don't even want to say one of the world's foremost experts. He's the world's foremost expert. Uh, and most are a very, very distant second. Um, and I know he's proud to say, not to say that about himself, but as an observer, that's my observation as a colleague. Uh, Doc, today's about uh, basically CCI. Is there one test? We all wish we can find sort of the litmus test. Do I have it? Don't I? What's the truth? What do people need to know as we wrap up today's show? Yeah, I just realized that, that any medical diagnosis, including CCI, is a combination of factors. You know, what comes back on your test? Uh, what's the history surrounding how you got it? What kind of symptoms do you have and your response to treatment? And all of that information equals getting to a diagnosis, in this case, of CCI. So just realize at the end of the day, we're looking at all of those things to try to get to the most accurate diagnosis we can. I sincerely wish there was a blood test I could give you that said with 100% accuracy, you have CCI or you don't. Uh, but that really doesn't exist. Uh, maybe one day it will or something like that will. Uh, so right now, we, we look at all those different things to get to a likely diagnosis because you know, diagnosis is the pillar of choosing the right treatment. That's the name of the game. Again, I'm going to just reiterate, if you've got questions about your particular care, you probably want to schedule either a telehealth appointment or if you're close or willing to travel for the best, you want to set up an appointment. If you want to know if you've got coverage, you can go to the website regenexcoverage.com and up to 7 million of you out there, some of you may be even watching, 
have coverage by your employer specifically to directly cover Regenx procedures across the Regenx network. That's the way you find out, you know, if you can be helped. And lastly, when you go to the Centeno Schultz Clinic, I want to make sure that you look for and ask for the proactive program. The proactive membership program really is the program for those people that want to get the best care at the best value. If you know you want to work with the world's best doctors, if you know you want to get ongoing care as part of your care, that it's not just a transactional visit, but it's a relationship to have ongoing access to the world's best doctors, and be able to bring friends and loved ones also into the fold, you want to make sure you ask about the proactive program. It's become the most popular program at Centeno Schultz for those people that want to stay ahead, as the name implies, stay proactive with your health, with your care, to get the best value and the best insider scoop. That's our show for today. On behalf of Dr. Chris Centeno, I'm your host, Dr. Jason Deitch. We thank you, as always, for watching. Our only ask is to please share this with others. There are many people suffering, unfortunately and unnecessarily, because they don't know what you now know. And all you got to do is basically invite people to ask their questions. They can come on in. They can watch us here on Mondays at the Centeno Schultz Facebook page on Fridays on the Regenix Facebook page. I'll note, keep an eye open for upcoming schedule changes on Fridays as the summer comes. But bring your friends, bring your family, bring your colleagues, I dare say bring your doctor, and have them ask whatever questions they would like to about any of these conditions. You are talking to, really, the world's foremost expert on regenerative orthopedics and orthobiologics. It's where it was invented, and if you want access to the best information that's out there, you'll tune in next time. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Please share it with friends. We'll see you Friday. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and be kind.